Earth, and welcome to the podcast Byzantium and Friends. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, I hope you're enjoying the summer. I am coming to you now from sunny Greece. So one topic that endlessly intrigues me is the relationship that societies have to their own past. And I don't just mean this as an academic topic of study. I mean also the countries that we live in and move through. And this is a personal experience for me, too. Uh, when I moved to the American Midwest from Greece, I was struck at the absence of a kind of material landscape history uh, in the places where people lived. There were no mountains on the horizons, no seas nearby. Uh, the terrain wasn't variegated in ways that were linked to history that people remembered and commemorated. Everything seemed very recent. Uh, towns and cities almost seemed like they were made by some kind of SimCity video game program where you could replace anything overnight. You could dig anywhere without fear of striking you know, archaeological remains, though you could hit power lines and gas lines. The geography of daily life just simply didn't intersect with the material past. Now, let me hasten to add that American society is deeply engaging with its own past all the time. It's just configured differently. It's not a kind of material reality lying around um, underneath our feet or in our you know, urban grids. It is configured very much um, in terms of the Enlightenment project that created the country in the first place and the ideals that it strove for and the degree to which the country has or has not uh, lived up to those ideals and the legacy of slavery. And these are debated in a kind of abstract way, but they, they're they part of the past that every American carries and, and experiences and still lives with. Um, and, and the country is wrestling with that even today. It's just a different kind of past. Let me add also from a certain point of view that the United States of America is one of the oldest countries in the world today. In terms of the sort of legal constitutional order under which it's been living, which has certainly sort of adapted and is much more fluid than you think. But nevertheless, it was created before most other countries, um, you know, reached the form in which we uh, recognize them today. So in a sense, it is one of the oldest political experiments that are is still ongoing. Jury's still out on it. Now, I encountered a very different relationship to the past in a country that I studied pretty intensely uh, for a while um, in the Previous, no, the decade before the previous decade, uh, which is Iceland. And we have this remarkable set of texts from about a thousand years ago, the, the sagas, and a language that has not changed very much, and claims that resonate with those of Greece that it's the oldest democracy in the world. And I, I found this very striking. Um, sort of parallel lives between Iceland and Greece in many ways, different though those countries are. And I went there, and the past is very much part of the landscape in Iceland, but not because of its material remains. Iceland doesn't have much by way of antiquities as such. Uh, you know, when they find the, the, the peg hole of a you know, Viking-era longhouse, they, that they, <laughs> they celebrate that as like, this is a major site, and they build a museum around it. And it's, it's adorable. But no, that's not where the past really is. It's in the connections between the modern society and that that is documented a thousand years ago and in the whole period in between through genealogical records and, you know, the ownership of farms and each farm has its history and it's a relatively unbroken history. So there's this really fascinating lived connection to the landscape that is mediated through texts and archives. I, I, that was, it was just fascinating. It's just a wholly different configuration of these elements. And then there's Greece. There is a lot that I could say here, but that's not my job in this podcast. I will say only that the, probably the primary way in which Greek society engages with its own past is materially. And per perhaps not primary but certainly the most proximate. It's the first zone of interaction with the past because it's everywhere. And it's so dense. There are very few places in the part of the world I've studied, like, like this side of the Hindus River, where it is so dense from not just the Bronze Age to the present, but the Neolithic uh, 
to the present. Uh, you know, some parts of the coast of Syria, Palestine, Judea, come close. Certainly some major cities in terms of concentration, like Istanbul and Rome and so forth. But as a land, you just don't get as much bang for the square meter as you do uh, in Greece. It's all just packed in tight, one on top, one layer on top of the other in such a small place. And those of you who live in countries that don't have this wealth of material past, you might think how wonderful it is. It's awesome. We've seen the photographs. We've visited Greece. It's wonderful places. And you turn a corner and suddenly you're transported into the, like you cross this dimensional threshold and you're now like visibly walking around uh, some ancient ruin. And it's just this, I, I, I used to find it a very awe-inspiring experience to discover these places in that way. And yet, there's also a downside to having it all around, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, with my guest. It's not always and only an asset. And there's also a history to how that relationship with the past came to be, uh, because what you experience today is not what you would find in the same land, you know, 100, 200 years ago. Uh, so there was a process that created that relationship and created that relationship through institutions. And we're going to talk about that process today. My guest is Jonathan Hall, who's a professor of classics and history at the University of Chicago. If you're interested in ancient Greek history or the study of ethnicity, generally, you will know his work already. Um, he was one of the pioneers of the study of ethnicity in the ancient Greek world. And in that book, Ethnic Identity in Greek Antiquity, he revealed the importance of the deep sort of mythological past, the myth histories of the Greeks in forming their ethnic identities in classical times, and also the importance of the Argive Plain, um, you know, all the sites around Argos, you know, Mycenae, and so forth, um, that were central to those stories. Now, his most recent book is Reclaiming the Past, Argos and its Archaeological Heritage in the Modern Era, and this takes us to the other side of the sort of chronological spectrum, and it focuses mostly on like the long 19th century and the way in which this incredibly dense archaeological uh, legacy of the city of Argos and more broadly the Argive Plain uh, came to be conf to take its modern configuration and in terms of institutions and concepts for understanding the past. So, for example, it looks at how we move from collections of curiosities to museums, from treasure hunts to professional excavations, from antiquities as elite commodities to national patrimonies, from local wealthy sponsors of digs to government ministries and bureaucracies, from local antiquarians to trained scholars from the capital or abroad and from personal memoirs to professional journals. So this we might call you know, how the past is institutionalized, what are the politics of those institutions, what kinds of debates raged around the decisions to keep or leave buried, to, to highlight, to you know, leave in silence, to build a museum, to commemorate or not, who owns the past, the competing interests, local, national, international, foreign scholars, um, all you know, trying to shape you know, their idea of the past of Argos. There are very few scholars who have written such excellent, insightful books on both ancient, like, archaic Greece on the one hand and modern Greece on the other. Uh, so it was a great pleasure to have Jonathan onto the podcast. A quick note. Um, I hope to continue this discussion about the presence of the material past in a subsequent episode on the Byzantine monuments of Constantinople. Um, also, thanks again to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Uh, here's my conversation with Jonathan Hall. Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Anthony. So we're going to talk about Argos. And mm -hmm. I should say for the benefit of the audience, or people mostly interested in Byzantium, that you have worked, sort of in the earlier part of your career, mostly on ancient Greece, archaic Greece, and, you know, focusing on Argos. And you've recently made a turn to 
uh, the modern archaeological discovery of Arcos and issues surrounding archaeological exploration and heritage and things like that. Um, and I should say that Argos is one of these interesting places in that it was kind of central to ancient Greek culture in so many ways, like so many of the myths and stories, and even the name Argives was kind of like sometimes a generic for Greeks. In, in some That's right. And then again in modern times, right? Mm -hmm. So in the revolution and Nafplion, the Argive plain, right? That's where the first capital was. And, you know, some amazing um, archaeological discoveries that took place there, like uh, Mycenae and Tyrants and so forth. In Byzantine times, maybe not so central, um, but um, you work some Byzantine material into this, and obviously archaeology always has to go through Byzantine layers, right? Right, right. Uh, to get to antiquity. So why don't you tell us first about, you know, how and why you made the leap from ancient Greece to modern Argos? So what drew you to the modern material? What were you hoping to find? So I suppose from the outside, this looks like a classic midlife crisis, right? But actually, there, there, there is a logic to this. Um, as you mentioned, my earlier work um, on ethnicity was focused on, on the Argolid. And if you're looking at archaeological evidence, then most of that is going to come from the town of Argos. So it's, it's, it's a town with which I've been familiar for, gosh, more than 30 years now, I guess. And the thing about Argos um, is even during the Byzantine period, um, it's been more or, continuous, more or less continuously occupied. Mm. Um, over six millennia. Well, what this means, though, then, is that antiquities, whether they're continuously visible or whether they've been brought to light by excavation, are immediately enmeshed within a modern urban fabric. Um, and actually, much of the information that we now have about Argos is not derived from programmed seasons of excavation, um, sort of large-scale right. digs. Um, it's, it's done by rescue excavations, which is where the local branch of the State Archaeological Service goes in and conducts an excavation of short duration. Um, and this is mandatory in cases where, let's say, an individual a property owner wants to redevelop their plot of land or the utilities company wants to lay cables or drains and so on. Um, and so the Archaeological Service goes in um, and determines, first of all, whether there are ancient remains um, beneath the soil, which is nearly always the case, at least in central Argos. And secondly, whether those remains have any special historical significance, which could, can result in uh, expropriation of the property uh, by the state. And so while, it was, while I was conducting my doctoral research, um, I, I was trying to identify exactly where throughout the town these rescue excavations had taken place in recent decades. And in doing that, I became acutely aware of the tension between local residents and the State Archaeological Service, uh, the tension between the desire for conservation, but the need to get on with your life, you know, right. to, to, to develop your infrastructure and upgrade your property and, and so on. So um, I've always had an interest in what we might call the past in the present. Um, it's only now that I've had the opportunity to pursue that interest further and to explore how the, the physical remnants of Argos, the, the monuments, the archaeology, um, were experienced by locals and outsiders alike um, over the past three centuries or so. So Jonathan, now that you were mentioning the rescue excavations, so that brought, took me back to, and I suddenly had a sort of flash that there must have been you must have done so much more work for this project than is visible on the page. If, because I remember you gave a talk and, and that, that I attended and you sort of talking about this, that in working through the materials from the rescue excavations, especially if they're old, like hundred years old or whatever, mm. that doesn't always map on clearly to the modern streets and the topography. And so you have right. to do like a modern, you know, reverse engineering of where this place was in order to find where the excavation even took place. That's right. Yes, they have changed street names, but yes. even within street, streets, they've actually changed the numbering system. And so, I mean, this is common, I think, throughout many towns and villages in Greece, but you, you can walk yeah. along the street and you'll find two numbers <laughs> on the yeah. door, right? And you're trying to figure out which is, the, which, which is the more recent number and which was the number at the time the rescue excavation took place. Yes, and, 
so I had this image because I did a little bit of that on in Mutilini in Lesbos, mm. so yeah, like 25 mm. years ago when I was there. And I, I was reading through the excavation reports in, in part, you know, because I was trying to find the canal between anyway, it, it, that separated the island from the main, the, the fort, which is a little the island. Fort, yes, 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 yes. And yes. They, they, anyway, but it, it's it's difficult work. You have to use these old maps and it's uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, so let's talk about Argos before we get started um, into the, you know, the history of the excavations. Um, so let's set the stage a little bit. So what are the main um, sites or monuments or sort of the pride of place um, artworks of Argos um, that that came up during this whole history? And so this, this is for the benefit of readers who might not know, you know, what Argos is famous for. Sure, sure. So there's a series of monuments that have remained archaeologically visible throughout most of their history. Um, and this means that they were already being commented upon by foreign travelers um, who, start, who start visiting Argos from the 17th century onwards. Um, and these remains include medieval fortifications on the Larissa Hill. And in many cases, these medieval fortifications sit right on top of ancient fortifications because the Larissa Hill was, was the main acropolis of ancient Argos. Actually, Argos had two acropolis, which is unusual but not unique. Um, but the taller one, the Larissa, was, was, was the more important one. And then at the foot of the Larissa Hill, there's a large terrace that uh, dates back to the 6th century BCE. Its original function is, is not entirely clear. Um, but on top of it, in the 2nd century CE, um, was built a, a Roman fountain house or nymphaeum, which was a gift to the city uh, by the Emperor Hadrian. Uh, to the south of that is a large, fairly well-preserved theatre. Um, they even mm. um, stage shows there during the summer. That dates to about 300 uh, BCE. The, the upper parts of the auditorium were always visible, the lower parts less so because of all the soil that had been washed down from the Larissa. So it was subject to a number of excavations. Actually, the first excavation took place under Veli Pasha, the, the son of the famous Ottoman renegade vassal Ali Pasha of Yanina. Uh, near the theatre are, are the remains of an impressive Roman building that we now know um, belonged to one of the largest bathhouses uh, in Greece. Um, but earlier travellers were, were at sea as to what it might be. Some thought it was a temple. Some of them describe their guides telling them that it was a harem of some legendary Argive king. I mean, these, these were obviously Turkish guides. Oh, yeah. um, uh, and Thomas Smart Hughes, who was, a, who was a Cambridge theologian, was told that it was the palace of Agamemnon, which caused him to have an apoplectic fit because he said, no, that's, that's nonsense. The palace of Agamemnon should be at Mycenae, not at Argos, although apparently nobody told Aeschylus. Um, and then south of the theatre, um, a monument that's much less visited and, and, and observed, is a theatral-like structure that was originally built in the fifth century BCE, probably to house the citizen assembly of Argos. And then during the Roman period was converted into an Odeon or concert hall. So those are the remains that have always been there. Then of course, there are remains that have come to light as a result of excavations, which have been conducted since the early 20th century. So the buildings in the ancient Agora, which is just south of the historical center. Then there are foundations of two temples inside the medieval fortifications on the Larissa Hill. And on the lower hill, the second acropolis of Prophetis Elias, uh, there's a prehistoric uh, Middle Bronze Age settlement on the summit. Beneath that, a sanctuary of Apollo, which we know was an oracular sanctuary. And then beneath that, um, a late Bronze Age chamber tomb cemetery. As for ancient artworks, uh, the archaeological museum houses some spectacular pieces. Uh, there's a monumental 8th century BCE pyxis, a, a huge vase that was used for the burial of a wealthy uh, female. There are the grave goods associated with a warrior burial found near the Odeon, which include a quite famous set of, of a bronze cuirass, a bronze helmet, and iron spits and fire dogs and so on. There's a fragment of a seventh century crater, a, a vessel used for mixing wine and water, which depicts the blinding of the Cyclops Polyphemus by Odysseus and his. Right, yeah. 
Yes, that's, that's a famous piece as well. Yeah. Um, there's a lyre that they found that's been constructed from a tortoise shell. And there are lots of fine examples of Roman sculpture from the baths. Unfortunately, the archaeological museum has been closed now for a number of years. Um, I was there recently and the whole building's been gutted. Um, the hope is that it will reopen in four years, but I, I fear that may be a little optimistic. Yeah, well, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Um, I referred to the Museum of Thebes, for example, which was closed for so many Indeed, years and, yes. and reopened. Yeah. And it's, it's really, really Spectacular. Nice. It's beautiful, yes. yeah. Uh, Delphi also, I remember, was... Anyway, yeah, they, mm. they will open. Oh, on, eventually, sure. <laughs> on, on archaeological timescale. <laughs> yes. Um, so but part of the work that you had to do, it, it was identify which of these monuments the travelers were referring to or because you know they didn't have standardized names until quite late right uh, and so you had to sift through all of this material to try to figure out what are they talking about but the frame of reference the point of reference for all of this is pausanias the ancient travel writer of the yes. second century ce um, who wrote a description of mainland Greece and especially of temples and artwork um, and the myths and histories associated with them. So he is kind of the leitmotif of the book in a way, like everybody who comes to Argos is mm. following in his footsteps or has his text in hand. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about Pausanias and you know how he becomes so important, uh, almost like a Sounds like a dictatorial figure, like everybody has to defer to his authority and, and so forth. But how does it yeah, play out? Yeah, I, I actually was was hoping that Pausanias would not be the leitmotif of, of, of the book. But you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to avoid him. Yeah. So Pausanias was a was a Greek intellectual uh, from Asia Minor, what is what is now Turkey. And shortly after the middle of the second century CE, uh, he visited uh, central Greece and the Peloponnese. And as you say, he wrote an account of, of what he saw um, and the stories um, behind uh, what he saw. And um, his importance for my story is that his account was indispensable reading for any traveler to Greece in the 18th or 19th centuries. Oh, am I, am I allowed to mention the 19th century? <laughs> I know you have very strong views about it, but- No, um, no, no. I... <laughs> But I will have that discussion some other Okay, time. okay. So, um, so he was indispensable reading. He still is. You know, when neophyte archaeologists go to Greece for the first time, um, they're encouraged to visit sites throughout Greece with a copy of Pausanias in translation, mm. unfortunately, of course, but um, in their backpack. Um, so Pausanias' work um, is considered now, was considered by the early travellers um, as as a kind of ancient guidebook. I mean, he's sometimes described as the ancient Baedeker. And it may well be that that was Pausanias' aim. That's what he was, he was trying to produce a guide for educated, wealthy travelers of his own day. Although if that was his aim, he was spectacularly unsuccessful because his book seems to have enjoyed very little popularity um, in the centuries immediately after uh, his, his death. Um, but I suppose starting about four decades ago, um, scholars have rediscovered Pausanias. Uh, there's been, a, there, there mm -hmm. was at any rate, a, a sort of renaissance of interest in him. Um, and much of that scholarship has demonstrated convincingly that quite apart from being a guidebook, one of the principal aspects of Pausanias' agenda is to invoke, um, resurrect even, um, a now lost Greece. Um, it's a nostalgic conjuring up um, of what Pausanias imagines Greece to have been before it was conquered by the Romans. Um, and because of this agenda, Pausanias doesn't actually describe everything he sees. He doesn't narrate everything he knows. I mean, there's a conspicuous lack of information for events or buildings of his own day, of the, of the Roman period. Um, now, another problem with Pausanias' account is that he intermeshes historical events and monuments that we are able to date today with legendary tales of heroes and mythical origins. And, and the end result is uh, a seemingly anachronistic pastiche. Mm. But this is the pastiche <laughs> that was familiar to all the travelers who were passing through in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and so their 
I mean, they have their own assumptions and predispositions, of course, but those are also uh, shaped or fashioned by the reception of this, this timeless um, anachronistic account that Pausanias preserves. And this gives rise in the end to a huge mismatch uh, between what travelers expected to see and what they actually saw. Yeah, the, so the uh, archeological armature of Argos and the Argolid plain is spectacular. Like we have to say this, it's, it's one of the most dense areas uh, with Bronze Age and classical and all the way into modern, uh, you know, from Mycenae down to Argos and Nafplion, you know, you can spend, well, You've <laughs> you spent decades, <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, literally, yes. But yes. even a casual tourist can spend you know a week and still be seeing amazing new things. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, another one of the themes um, in the book is how often visitors, especially you know coming from their classical educations abroad or from you know Athens or wherever, having Pausanias in hand, how they're disappointed. Yeah. Uh, in what they see. And you, you coined this great phrase, it's monumental disappointments. <laughs> so what are they <laughs> expecting to find? Um, and, you know, why did they have those expectations? Right. Well, they were certainly expecting to find a lot more <laughs> than they actually did. Um, now, admittedly, um, these expectations were sometimes unrealistic. Um, there's this uh, uh, disgraced Sicilian abbot called uh, Saverio Scrofani, who passed through Argos in the 1790s. And at one point he expresses the hope that the house of his Turkish landlord, where he's gonna stay the night, uh, might stand on top of the ruins of Agamemnon's palace. That would have caused Thomas Smart Hughes to have another fit. But um, uh, even more sober-minded travelers, however, who, who were well acquainted with Greek lands uh, expressed their disappointment. So um, the Irish painter and antiquarian Edward Dodwell, who visited the Peloponnese uh, a decade after Scrophony, um, rhetorically asked, you know, where are all these 30 temples that Pausanias describes? Where, where are the tombs, the gymnasium, the stadium? Where are all these statues? Uh, and again, this shows the influence that Pausanias' text exercised on European travellers. But it still doesn't really, I think this is, this is the heart of your question, it doesn't really explain why Argos should be any different for these travellers than, than, I don't know, Athens or, or Corinth or Corinth. Thebes, for that matter. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my suspicion, although I should say I haven't conducted any systematic analysis on this, but my suspicion is that Pausanias' account of Argos is unusually dense and richly textured. Uh, compared with other urban environments. Mm. Now, why that might be the case is a fascinating question. Um, and it might have something to do with the way that Argive residents were packaging their city um, in the second century CE. Uh, scholars have often noticed a tendency among the ancient Argives to overvalue their past. Mm. Um, we can see this actually as early as the 6th century BCE. There's a monument there where they're sort of claiming this, this uh, lineal connection with the, the seven against Thebes. And why it should be is, is an interesting question, but I suspect it's in compensation for the status and esteem which Argos felt it was owed, but not necessarily accorded in its rivalry with Sparta to be the preeminent city of the Peloponnese. Oh, yeah. In any case, that tendency to overvalue the past is, if anything, exacerbated even further in the Roman period. Um, and indeed, I think some elements of that, uh, we might call it um, self-proclaimed exceptionalism, uh, survived even into the early modern period. Um, this notion that, that Argos was the oldest inhabited city, certainly in Greece, mm. if not in, in Europe, Right. So according to that argument, Argos might be the victim of its own success, uh, the, 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 the success of its own PR. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, and Pausanias would certainly have a reason to um, play Argos up, uh, seeing, you know, as his interest is in archaic Greece, uh, probably more than mm -hmm. any other period. Um, and Argos is like situated right at the heart of uh, the archaic Greek world. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. I've actually seen traces of the same phenomenon in the Byzantine period. 
um, in part because you have these very well-educated Constantinopolitans coming to Greece to be you know, bishops or governors or whatever, and they're trained in classical texts, including Pausanias. Mm -hmm. uh, and you actually even see this dynamic where the locals have also, I don't know how, but they view their red Pausanias or they've picked up on what visitors want to hear and are uh -huh. serving it back to them. And there's this kind of feedback loop. But we'll, we'll get into that um, in a moment. Um, I want to turn to the um, back to the archaeological discovery of Argos. And very often, the archaeological exploration of Greece takes the form of the following kind of narrative where some enlightened or classically educated outsider, whether from you know, Europe, Western Europe or Athens, will come to a small provincial Greek town in you know, the 19th century and you know, with a superior understanding and they'll shed light on what the locals sort of don't understand because they're either indifferent to it or ignorant or superstitiously afraid of it, like, oh, there are demons in these statues and so on. Hmm. And what I loved about your book is that you show, you, you, you study these relationships very closely and you show that that script didn't always play out that way and that the relationships were sometimes configured very differently. Mm. Um, so tell us about some of these encounters between sort of outside enthusiasts coming in and local antiquarians that took a very right, interesting form. Right. Well, unfortunately, the exception probably proves the rule. I mean, by and large, these encounters between Western uh, travelers and local residents are extremely colonialist in nature because, of course, the European travelers had benefited from an education in classics, a familiarity with the ancient Greek and Roman authors what, that was largely, if not universally, denied to the residents of Ottoman-occupied Greece. Mm. Um, I should say that, on the other hand, um, the locals uh, in Argos and, and elsewhere throughout Greece um, had a far more direct, uh, even visceral connection with the physical remnants of the past. I mean, what we would call the archaeology. Whereas for the Western travelers, archaeology in this, in this date, uh, this, in this period, is really only a sort of incidental detail to flesh out you know, the literary text. But as you say, um, there are occasions when there are deviations from this, this standard script. Um, I think my favorite example is the encounter in Argos in 1806 between the French savant and diplomat uh, Francois René de Chateaubriand and his host, the Greek doctor, uh, Yanis Dionysius Avramiotis. Um, and what's interesting about this is that both parties to this encounter actually have recalled their memories of it. Um, obviously, oh, right, yes. yeah, obviously, they have slightly different things to say about it. They even disagree on some details. Um, Chateaubriand claims he only stayed one night in Argos, and his host says, no, no, I managed to persuade him to stay a, a second night. Um, now, Avramiotis, the Greek doctor who hosted uh, Chateaubriand, had not been a lifelong resident of Argos. He was actually born on the island of Zakynthos uh, when it was still under Venetian occupation. And like many sons of elite families in the Ionian Islands, he'd been educated in Italy. Um, he took a degree in medicine at the University of Padua. Um, but he was also a keen antiquarian. He was friends with Fauvel, the, the French vice consul in Athens. Um, and he was also friends with uh, Charles Robert Cockerell and Karl Halle von Hallerstein, uh, two architects who are associated with the um, identification description and then despoiling of the Afaya temple um, mm. on the island of Egina. And Avramiotis was also a member of the Philomuso Seferia, the, the Society of the Friends of the Muses um, in Athens. And at the time of Chateaubriand's visit, Avramiotis was engaged in um, going over a map. He was actually doing this in connection with Fauvel. And they were replacing modern toponyms with what they thought the ancient place names were. And, and Chateaubriand said, this is, this is jolly good stuff. Yes, I, I, I approve of that. Um, but then things sort of take a different direction. The next, the next day, uh, Chateaubriand climbed the Larissa Acropolis. And it's clear that really all he wanted to do was take in the view, and, and if you've been up there, it is, it is a magnificent uh, yeah. panoramic view. But when he came down again, his Greek host uh, took him to task because he hadn't been seeking out every stone and inscription, all right? So Avramiotis, the local, is saying, yes, it's all very well knowing these Greek and Roman authors and everything, but you have to supplement that <laughs> with a close knowledge of the material, the, of the physical material, right? And along similar lines, Avramiotis counseled Chateaubriand to study 
the ancient theater at, at close quarters. And Chateaubriand said, no, no, I've already, I saw it from the road over in the distance. So that, 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 that's enough for me. Um, and Avrami Otis was so incensed by what he considered the anti-scientific ignorance, boorishness even, of his uh, eminent French guest, that 10 years later, he published a blistering critique of Chateaubriand's account of his journey through Greece. Uh, for his part, Chateaubriand complained in a letter to the Comte de Marcellus, he, this is the guy who procured the Venus de Milo for the Louvre. Right. Uh, he complains that you know, all he wanted to do was be left alone so he could wander through ruins and imagine that he was in the shadow of Agamemnon, but that his host, whom he describes as a, quote, captious and spiteful doctor, unquote, hounded those dreams and wanted him to measure stones instead. So it's a rather nice inversion of the standard sort of colonialist trope between learned outsider and superstitious or ignorant insider. Yes, uh, Abraham Yadis wanted to do the spade work, the, the mole work. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, Chateaubriand is just a character. <laughs> I mean, he just he pops up everywhere, no matter what part of right. you know, the history of Greece you're reading about. The guy shows up, and uh, anyway, you know he'd take to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, well, you know he went to you know he went to America as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, anyway, um, so I imagine that you made use of a great deal of local antiquarians, right? In, in Argos, like every city or town in Greece has its complement of local antiquarians mm -hmm. who have searched out every remains of a chapel, every ancient stone, every yeah. thing yeah. like that. They, yeah. they mix it all together. And sometimes it's very fanciful. I found this in Mytilene as well, but it's also very, very useful because they'll tell you where to go to look for that fragment that's been built into the side of that little chapel or whatever exactly yeah. and they've done all that work you know whatever they make of it afterwards it's not you know professional and up to academic standard or anything but it's indispensable anyway um so you I mentioned actually I, let me let me just correct you a little bit yeah. there I, I think actually a lot of the antiquarian work on Argos that has been conducted by you know non-professional academics um, yeah you know, lawyers and other professionals who just have yeah. an interest in the past I would say that it is actually up to academic, I mean, accepted academic standards, um, but it's just not published. You know, I mean, they don't have the connections that we have. So they're, they're published in, in very local home produced journals that, that are difficult to find, certainly difficult to find outside Greece and often difficult to find outside Argos itself. You have to, you know, you have to trawl through used bookshops and so on. That's true. And they've done great work, especially when it comes to coins and Byzantine seals. Like yes. a lot of our collections come from them. And the published form ev eventually is not much different from, you know, the material that they give to our, you know, professional sigillographers and numismatists. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you mentioned the colonialist, you know, encounters. Um, mm. And your book begins when Argos is part of one empire, the Ottoman Empire. And it concludes, you know, with the nation state of modern Greece. But for a long time, even Greece was a client of the Western empires. Um, well, also Russia um, and, you know, England, France and so forth. Mm. So how did this context of empire shape this reclamation of the past in Argos? Right, right. That, that's a very complicated question. Um, I mean, as you know, the, the Greek revolution might have had a very different outcome if it hadn't been for the belated intervention um, of the combined fleets of Britain, mm -hmm. France and Russia at the Battle of Navarino in October 1827. Um, now, the Russians are actually an interesting case because save for some um, limited naval operations off the island of Poros in 1831, they, they're reluctant to get too involved in Greece, actually. And this is, I think this is one of the great ironies of late 18th and early 19th century Greek history. You know, in the lead up to the revolution, the Greeks are thinking, oh, the Russians, they're, they're co-religionists, they're gonna liberate us from the Ottomans and so on. And you're aware of all these prophecies that were circulating mm -hmm. about how, how the Greeks would be liberated by the Xanthoyenos, you know, the golden haired race. This was the Russians. And it's not by accident, I think, that the, um, the first general-in-chief of the revolutionary army, Dimitrios Ypsilandis, 
um, had served in the Russian army, or indeed that the, the independent Greece's first governor, Count Yanis yeah. Kapodistrias, had been um, a foreign, um, foreign minister uh, for Tsar Alexander. Um, but, you know, in the end, the Russians never really came through. Um, Britain and France, on the other hand, did intervene more directly in the affairs of Greece in the first few decades after liberation. I mean, every time Greece uh, did something of which they disapproved and they just blockade the Piraeus, you know, yeah. um, and forced them uh, to toe the line. Um, and France in particular um, had a history of intervention because in 1828, uh, the French dispatched an expeditionary force to the Peloponnese um, to assist in expelling the army of Ibrahim Pasha. Um, now, three years early, Ibrahim Pasha, who was the, the son of the, the vassal ruler of Egypt the, um, on behalf of the Ottomans, um, had invaded the Peloponnese and recaptured a lot of areas that had, that had been liberated uh, soon after the, the revolution began. Um, and they were successful in the end, this, this French army was successful in the end, but, but to get towards how this might be implicated with archaeology, uh, the French army was accompanied by a scientific section. Um, this was all modelled on Napoleon's um, expedition to Egypt. So there were, there were botanists, there were architects, there were archaeologists, uh, antiquarians and so on. And it's in the context of the activities of that scientific section that Capodistrias uh, permitted French archaeologists to convey to Paris some of the metopes of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, right? And this despite a prohibition on the sale or transfer of antiquities that have been mm. approved by Capodistrius uh, himself. So um, as you intimate, the involvement of foreign archaeologists in Greece has been bound up with international politics from very early on. But in truth, I think much of the foreign archaeological activity in Greece uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was less a byproduct of direct imperial or colonial exploitation, particularly by these three so-called great powers, as it was enabled by um, what the Harvard anthropologist Michael Hertzfeld has called crypto-colonialism. All right, this, this is a form not of, not of political dependency, but economic dependency. Mm. And it manifests itself in, in, in the form of a vigorous promotion of an ancient Greek culture that was explicitly designed to appeal to Western intellectual tastes and obviously economic backers. So this kind of crypto-colonialism involved a larger number of um, creditors, so to speak, um, beyond just Britain, France and Austria, uh, Britain, France and Russia. It, it included uh, Prussia and Austria and Italy, eventually the United States. And I think it's within this context that one can look at the creation of foreign schools or institutes of archaeology uh, in Greece. There are now, I think, more than, than 30 of them. Yeah. Um, in terms of archaeology at Argos itself, the first systematic large-scale excavations commenced in 1902, under a Dutch archeologist named Carl Wilhelm Volgraf. Uh, now at that time, the Netherlands didn't have its own Institute of Archeology. span So Volgraf was uh, sponsored by the foreigners section of the Ecole Francaise or the, the French School of Archeology. span And I suppose it's tempting to see this as a legacy of the earlier intervention of the French expeditionary force, the scientific section of that. Um, but I've actually found no evidence that this was anything other than, than coincidence, um, especially since the initiative seems to have been taken by Volgraf himself rather than by, by the French school. Yeah, sure. Um, the, so empires often use archaeology as a way of symbolically projecting right, their power um, of you know, taming and mastering and classifying and cataloging the lands that belong mm -hmm. to them. And you mentioned Napoleon's uh, expedition to Egypt, which produced this sort of monumental multi-volume description of Egypt that, you know, still, you know, it's like a foundation for the field and it opened up archaeology in Egypt and the decipherment of um, hieroglyphics eventually and all of this. So, you know, it's one of these cases where scientific or scholarly advancement and colonial interests are sort of intertwined. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, there are aspects of that in, in Greek history as well. Um, nothing quite so, so flagrant and sort of ideal type as what Napoleon did, but 
you know, over time, so I have the sense that those institutions gradually were kind of tamed and normalized within the operations of a sort of autonomous modern nation state. So you have the, the schools, mm -hmm. uh, so it's a collaborative relationship um, rather than the one that you have. I mean, before the revolution, I mean, I'm, so as a Byzantinist, I'm a bit sensitive to all of this because Greece was always just seen as an asset. Yeah. In other words, both the idea of Greece and what it stood for being appropriated by Western European powers, but also we want the manuscripts and we want the art form and we're just, the art and we're yeah. just going to go there and take it. Right, right. And in order to do that, narratives were developed that justified it. For example, that the locals, they, they, they don't know, you know, what the worth of this stuff is. Mm -hmm. This is very Orientalist stuff. Um, you know, they walk among these ruins with indifference um, or that they are afraid of them because they are inhabited by demons and these superstitious Orthodox people, you know, they don't know. Those ideas are in Gibbon. Yeah. They're in Gibbon. Um, in the 18th century, in, you know, wrapped up in his history of Byzantium. Anyway, and so I, I just wanted to digress a little bit on all of that because I think it's very important. Um, which leads me to my next question here, which is about the ownership of the past and, mm. you know, who ultimately owns these antiquities um, and who has a stake in them. And of course, a lot of people have and powers have stakes in them, uh, but the, the stakes are configured very differently. So could you just give us a broad sense of the different people who have a stake and an interest in the antiquities of Argos and how those sometimes clash, or, you know, what, what, what's some of the interesting history there? Right. So I, I just mentioned uh, Michael Hertzfeld, um, and in another study that focuses on the town of Rethymno um, on mm. Crete, he documents the tensions that, that can arise between official state conceptions of archaeological heritage writ large um, and more local perceptions of the lived environment as, as something similar to, a, a, I guess, a filial inheritance. Um, and at Argos, uh, prior to the construction of a national state apparatus in the 1830s, um, you have a situation which, you know, as, as you describe, you have outside elements that really just want to plunder Greece, um, but not with impunity, I think. I mean, the, the practical ownership of at least movable antiquities, so things like coins, statuettes, um, fragments of inscriptions, was really the result of informal transactions between locals and outsiders, um, in which locals did retain some, some degree of agency. Mm -hmm. um, and we hear about this. So we, we hear about um, certain um, hosts uh, that uh, visitors, that travelers uh, lodged with, who, who you know, Greeks, who, who are actually engaging in what we would now call, you know, antiquities trafficking. Um, the dynamics then change completely with the creation of a state archaeological service. Uh, Greece uh, is one of the earliest countries to have actually enacted legislation protecting um, its antiquities. And, and these, were, these were already written into the earliest um, constitutions that were passed during the early yeah. stages of the revolution and then um, enshrined in the third National Assembly and the, and the fourth National Assembly. And there was the establishment of, of sort of strategies of surveillance and enforcement um, of that legislation. And so this, of course, can lead to a kind of standoff uh, between the state um, and the provinces, between, between locals and a depersonalized state. And two examples uh, from the book come to mind. Um, the first occurred in the 1880s. Um, for a few decades prior to that, antiquities that had been discovered in Argos and the vicinity uh, were being curated in a small collection uh, that was open to the public on certain days uh, that was housed in the former Dimachia, the, the town hall um, on, the, on the principal cathedral square um, of Argos. But in the middle of the 1880s, some pieces were transferred to the newly completed National Archaeological Museum in Athens. And by uh, common consent, the pieces that were transferred were obviously the finer items, mm. including um, a lot of the sculpture and dedications that had been excavated at the Argive Harion at, at, at Prosimna. This was a very important regional sanctuary in antiquity. Um, it was discovered purely by accident by a Scottish Philhellene, Thomas Gordon, 
um, who, who was an antiquarian, but, but also actually contributed um, his, his expertise to the revolution um, at the beginning and end at any rate. Um, during a shooting party, we're told he, he, he came across um, this site. Of course. And soon after he excavated it with a, another Scottish Philhellene, uh, George Finlay. Um, and then later in 1854, uh, the German philologist Konrad Bursian and the Greek archaeologist Alexandros Rizos Rakavis um, also excavated there and they, they uncovered various um, fine works of art and architecture. And these were all being kept locally and then transferred to Athens. Now, local reactions uh, to the transfer were a little slow to emerge, but certainly by the first decade of the 20th century, we've got articles in the local press bemoaning what they describe as the stripping of the provinces. Um, and they actually, they actually appeal to, to a parallel situation in Italy. They say in Italy, you know, the, these artifacts are being kept in local museums and that, you know, it's good for the local economy because visitors come and so on. And why can't we be a little more entrepreneurial about this? So you start seeing this sort of um, this, this standoff between locals um, and the state archaeological service. The, the second example is, is more recent um, and it concerns a building which um, houses the recently opened Byzantine Museum of the Argonaut. Have, have you seen this, Anthony? No. Okay. It's, it's, I mean, it only opened, I think, three or four years ago. Um, it's not a large museum, but it's, it, but it's very nicely done. Um, but the building in which it's housed was originally constructed in 1828 to 29 um, on the orders of Capodistrias um, as barracks for, the, uh, for two squadrons of the Greek cavalry. And it had a long and, and storied history, but by the 1970s, the structure was dilapidated, it had been abandoned, and the municipal council voted to demolish it and, and redevelop the site. And the, the, the issue immediately became uh, divisive. Um, now, to be sure, there were residents of Argos who wanted to protect what they regarded as a historically significant building, and they, they formed a local conservation society, but I don't think they really numbered more than a few hundred at, at most. In very broad terms, the dispute pitted local politicians, developers, and entrepreneurs against the state archaeological service, the central archaeological council, and various Athenian intellectuals and, and newspaper editors. Now, interestingly, foreigners were considered complicit with the state authorities on both these occasions. Mm. Um, on the first occasion, Volgraf, the Dutch archaeologist, was repeatedly accused by the Argive press of conspiring with state authorities to send the finer objects that he excavated to Athens rather than hand them over to the local prefect of antiquities. To be honest, I, I'm not sure he had much of a choice in the matter, but, but, right. but that was the criticism. Um, and as for the barracks, uh, the, the French School of Archaeology, which from the 1950s did uh, begin to conduct systematic excavations at Argos, um, they took the side, obviously, as you might expect, of the conservationists and of the archaeological service, um, and that led to a lot of complaints. Uh, um, complaints were actually lodged with the French ambassador to Greece. On other occasions, however, you can triangulate the relationship between inner local insiders, state insiders, and outsiders rather differently. Um, and divisions are actually drawn between state archaeological services um, and foreign archaeologists. And the classic case here, it probably won't surprise you to learn, is Heinrich Schliemann. Um, Schliemann didn't dig at Argos itself, uh, but he did conduct excavations at nearby Mycenae and Tyrans, and they were followed with a lot of interest um, by, and prurience, I would say, um, by the local press. Um, and there's much fascinating research that's been conducted, is continuing to be conducted um, on Schliemann's legacy. Uh, you're probably aware that the American School of Classical Studies in Athens has digitized a lot of the Schliemann archive, and it's, it's fascinating material. You can get access from their website if, if it's not um, oh, nice. indiscreet to, to put a plug in for that. Um, but you can get some sense of how controversial Schliemann was, even in his own lifetime, um, by local press reports of these excavations, where his behavior is consistently uh, contrasted very negatively to the sort of professionalism and sobriety of the Greek archaeologists who were charged with uh, actually monitoring his activities. Yes, I remember from, was it David Trail's biography? Yes, yes. Um, now, well, I, I, I think, 
I think I think the pendulum is beginning to swing yes. a little bit um, in the other direction now. But yes, um, I've gotten that sense that you know that biography maybe goes a little bit too far, um, <laughs> but it was still eye opening to me. Like you know, Schliemann mm. was just this like giant of you know nineteenth century archaeology, and like that's how he was taught in school. Like his major discoveries, and you know. Um, what he did, especially at Troy and Mycenae, was to, you know, create this immense international interest in these places, yeah. whose value, I mean, all, you know, symbolically, but also even monetary, was just tremendous. So you don't want to ditch Sleeman altogether, <laughs> uh, but he's a really problematic person. Mm. <laughs> And and fascinating, you know, the way he learned languages and you know. Yes, and, yes, yeah. He was a he was a true polyglot. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's so. It's good that you bring out the tensions between the national center, sort of Athens and its institutions, and mm. local perspectives, because uh, some in the audience might think that the tensions over who owns the archaeological past is between like smaller countries and the great powers that have taken some of the best stuff, like the, the right. Parthenon marbles, the Nefertiti busts from Egypt. Sure, sure. Well, it is that as well, of course. Yeah. It, yes, yes, uh, mm. that's true. Uh, but there's a kind of sort of fractal version of that relationship between yeah. national capitals and local lo locales that say, hey, why'd you take our stuff? Right, uh, right. I, I visited the museum at Mycenae. That's also another new one and i think they it brought is. some things back from athens to house there they did it's, it's funny you should bring that up because i was actually just at the archaeological museum of mycenae with chicago students a few oh, weeks right. back and one of the questions that they 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 raised was well why are we seeing replicas a lot of a lot of the most mm. famous items why why aren't why aren't they returned to mycenae why are they still in the national archaeological museum and you know, there are various <laughs> answers to this. Part, part of it is the philosophy on where finds should be housed tends to shift every few decades. Yeah. Um, a part of it is, as you say, the Mycenae Archaeological Museum is, is new. So, um, you know, for a long time, there, there wasn't any option uh, to, to um, curate the items from Grove Circle A, let's say. Um, at Mycenae. Um, but you are right uh, that some of the, the less glitzy um, items um, have been returned to Mycenae, yes. And it's a great view from the, that museum, I have to say. Yes, <laughs> yes Really nice is. location. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to probe <clears throat> the local perceptions a little bit more mm -hmm. and kind of get at this tension that exists in... Um, many Greek towns and, 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 and cities, or even villages and fields, which is this tension between taking pride in the local archaeological heritage on the one hand, mm. but being kind of afraid or suspicious of archaeologists on the other. Mm. Um, and so what is it that local communities, cities like Argos have to gain or lose when archaeologists come calling? Oh. Well, so the fear, and, and it is a very real one, it's one that's been realized many times, um, is that archaeological ex exploration will at best lead to delays in, in redevelopment. Um, and sometimes these delays can be up to two or three years. Um, and at worst, expropriation uh, of one's property. Um, and if you walk around um, Argos today, you'll see plenty of plots of land that are fenced off, some of them quite large areas. They're fenced off um, and there are sort of dating, dated placards that reveal that there was an intention to sort of expose these areas as, as items of archaeological significance, but, but they're inaccessible, they're overgrown, nothing's being done to them. And for very good reasons. I mean, you know, I, I don't doubt the sincerity of the archaeological service in trying to sort of uh, showcase uh, these, these parts of Argos's past, but obviously, you know, they have stretched resources. But I can also see how galling it would be to a modern resident of Argos to sort of walk around and say, okay, yeah, I knew the person whose, whose property was expropriated and they, they haven't really done anything with it. So, so there is this fear and suspicion um, of archaeologists. The benefits... Um, that are thought to accrue to archaeological exploration are, I think, largely economic 
in nature. I mean, sure, there are plenty of local enthusiasts for whom the cultural significance of ancient Argos is, is, is enough. Um, but Argos is, is, you know, it's one of these unpretentious market towns with an economy that is still largely uh, dependent on, on agriculture. And its residents, not unreasonably, need to be convinced of the economic benefits that might offset the potential disruption and inconvenience associated with archaeological investigation. So the hope, much as expressed in newspapers you know, more than a century ago, is that the antiquities of Argos will attract visitors um, who will then contribute to the local economy. Unfortunately, uh, and this is perhaps a slightly sort of a pessimistic tone on which, on which the book ends, I'm not entirely sure that this is a, a realistic hope. There have been a series of uh, plans proposed to connect scattered archaeological sites by pedestrian walkways, even of creating an integrated archaeological park. And these plans have only partially, in fact, barely uh, been realized. But at the same time, the unusually narrow streets um, of the town, uh, especially in the center, um, and the lack of designated parking areas mean, mean that Argos is not easily accessible to tourist buses. Um, the same goes for the Larissa Castle, which I mentioned earlier. It's recently been landscaped, consolidated, and partially reconstructed for a sum of nearly 1 million euros. And it, it's spectacular. I mean, they've done a great job, but it's really difficult to get to. I, I, I took a group uh, just three weeks ago, actually, um, of students up the narrow, sinuous road on a 50-seater bus, and it is painfully slow and challenging, um, even for the most experienced of bus drivers. Uh, yeah, you use donkeys. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it was on um, Sandorini at the the Thera town that where you mm -hmm. go up one side and they're donkeys. And I, I have you done that? Um, anyway, that, that's that's the caldera. That's that's from the port up to Fira. There's that. No, but also um, on one side of that massive rock oh. which Thera is built. Oh this, yes, 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 yes. This this is the harder the mid, side. Yes, yes. Mid nineties. Yes, there was yeah, a yeah. little donkey ride. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, anyway, no, okay. Uh, sorry. Um, so, uh, hold on, I lost my train of thought. I'll make a note here. Um, about one hour. Okay. Um, good, good, very good. Um, do you have, do you have final thoughts or should I wrap it up there? Um, I think you can probably wrap it up there. Okay. I mean, I did have a couple of uh, one thought, but I don't think it's, it's profound enough to, to extend the broadcaster. Should I ask, like, what are you working on next? Is that no. a... No? Okay. No, no because I, I, thought, I thought I was clear, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm less clear right now, so... <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Let me see where... Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't right, know Jonathan, if... You, but I don't know if you did want to... I mean, it's entirely up to you, but um, if you want, I mean, you mentioned earlier about the feedback loop question and you said we were going to come to it. Oh. And, in, and in the interest of time, you've obviously left it out, but it's entirely yeah. up to you. I don't... Um, no, it's fine. You, 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 want to, you want to move on. I get it. <laughs> no, no, I was just thinking of how to wrap it up, but you're right. I did leave that hanging, but I don't think anybody will know. <laughs> Probably not. Not. The, yeah, the audience is like, you know, commuting to work. They're not like, <laughs> um, though I, it, episodes are beginning to be cited in, in academic uh, publications. Really? Huh. Yeah, yeah, it's beginning to happen because sometimes like this episode is about a book and, you know, people who are interested in the material will go read the book mm. and mm. they'll cite the book. But some of the episodes I do are, um, they're, they're, the material isn't in print anywhere. I'm just getting people to talk about a topic that they know about, but it's not the sort of regular academic publication. Yeah. Anyway, and so those are beginning to be cited as, you know, these podcasts are kind of a bit like an oral history of the field too. In, in, in hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Um, well, all right, Jonathan, um, I'm sure we can trade stories about, um, you know, exploring Greek towns and, you know, the. Uh, you know, predicaments that archaeology and archaeologists find themselves in sometimes. Um, but, you know, that can, you know, go on forever. Um, I think we have a very good sort of coherent um, discussion here about 
um, the issues that you raise in the book. So thank you for both for writing the book and for coming onto the podcast. Um, I hope that it's illuminated some of the, the you know, many, many sort of difficult contexts that archaeology and the exploration and ownership of the past uh, find themselves in today. And this story will continue. Thank you very much.